We fixed the technical difficulties. We're all good now. <laughs> Everybody's had a lovely week and enjoying the nice cooler weather. Yay. <laughs> Starting to feel like fall. Trick or treat. Happy Halloween. <laughs> um, <laughs> Everybody's having a good week. We're going to start a good week today, right? Brand new week. Okay. Um, this morning. Um, good morning. Good morning. I'm. The scriptures that I'm going to read this morning are nothing new. Oh, I feel like I never have anything new. <laughs> um, but over the last few weeks, um, what God has um, put in my heart and has been saying to me about... Um, really a, manifest, a manifestation of him in, in me. Um, and a couple of weeks ago when I spoke, um, I talked about a, a shift that had been made in me um, because of what God had said to me. And I think I'm going to continue in that a little bit today. Um, you know, when you have to talk to a 13-year-old and explain things to her, it kind of opens your mind up, right? <laughs> and I'm, I'm so very thankful that Leah's in a different place than I was when I was her age. Yes, yes. Um, you know, I grew up in church my whole life, but the place I was when I was Leah's age was not a place of understanding that God's love was unconditional. And... Um, that he loved me no matter what, and all that he had in store for me was good. There, he, nothing else for me but good. And so Leah's in a completely different place because of her understanding. And I think that years from now, when she's my age, she'll be in a greater place than I am now because of that. Um, that her whole life, she'll be in a, a, a greater place than me because of where she started. And I'm very thankful of that. And Addison as well. I think all of our kids will be. And I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, but as I, as I talked to her, um, and as she talked to me, <laughs> um, there were things that came up. There were conversation that we had that um, really made me think. We have, um, in this house, for a long time, have been, um, Pastor Randy's taught a finished work, and he's taught a grace message, and I'm very, very thankful for that, because we wouldn't be where we are if it, had, if it were not for that. Um, but I think, I'm going to talk for Angie, okay? I can't talk for anybody else, as I always tell y'all, I have talked for me, can't talk for anybody else. But, and I don't want to make, I don't, um, I was talking to somebody this week, <laughs> and they were like, the, you're going to make religious people mad. <laughs> and I don't want to make anybody mad. Um, I don't want to take anything away from anybody. But, um, for me, those things held me back. For me, those things stop me, and they still do. They still do. Why? Because the, what stops us is what's here. What stops us is what's in between our ears, um, not what's in here. This, what my spirit man never stops me, <laughs> never holds me back. But my my brain, what's in between my ears, very much so does. And I think, um, for me, that. Um, we were taught so much that <clears throat> about what Adam did 
and about sin and about the devil and all of these things that they made them so great. They made them so big. And why were they big? They made them big to control me. They made them big to control me because that was the only way they could control me. The only way you can control me is to put fear in me and to make me fearful. So I was controlled by being afraid that something was going to happen to me and that I was going to go to hell and I was going to burn forever. Um, somebody was going to, you know, I was going to disappoint somebody. I was going to, you know, I, I've told y'all before, my, I don't like to, di I did not like to disappoint my mother, okay? Leah looked at me and said something about the look on my face. I said, did you not know my mother? Okay, all my mama had to do was look at me, and I was like, okay, sorry. Okay, she just, she had the look, okay? So that's all it took. Dean's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Dean even knew the look, okay? So that was my fear, okay, was that I was going to disappoint somebody, I was going to upset somebody. And so they controlled me with that, okay? So they made it so big and so great that they could control me with it. So... What that only did was make what God did, what Jesus Christ did, less than. It only made it less than enough. Because I was afraid, instead of living out of a place of thanksgiving, out of a place that I knew that I was provided for and I knew I was cared for. You know what? You know what's greater than fear? Love. <laughs> Love. Love is greater than fear. Because you know what? If I knew how much he loved me and I knew how much he had done for me and I knew how much he had sacrificed for me and I saw the greatness of that, then I would live out of a place that I knew I was loved. And I knew that he cared for me and that it was bigger than my fear. <clears throat> bigger than my fear. And we know that there is nothing left for God to do. Right? We know that. We understand that. That God doesn't have to do anything else. He's... He did everything in Jesus Christ. He did it all. There's nothing left for him to do. And that, in that, is complete and it's finished, right? We got that. Um, but we have, because of what's in between our ears, what's here, I have lessened that work. I have made it not enough. <clears throat> this is where you're going to get mad, okay? And I've done that because I needed an excuse. I needed a reason. I needed an excuse. I will tell you right now, I don't understand everything. I don't get it all. I don't know it all. And I'll be the first person to tell you that. Okay? I do not understand everything. I do not have all the answers. What I do have is Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what I do have. But what I've done, in my, what I can tell you in my life I've done, is I needed a reason why I had to explain something, okay? I had to explain why something happened, and what's the easiest way to explain why something happened? Make it somebody else's fault. <laughs> Make it somebody else's fault, okay? It wasn't my fault. It's not your fault. It's, it's out there. It's my first. I make it somebody else's fault. That it happened. That that's the way it is. And so instead of understanding the greatness of what Jesus Christ did for us, we've made it less than what Adam did to us. So that we could explain why we don't live in a place where Christ would have us live. This is Angie, okay? I'm, I'm explaining the way that I feel and what is going on inside of me. Because to me, right now, I've got to come to a place where there's no more excuses. I've got to come to a place where I'm living in a place where I don't have an excuse. And there's no more reasons why it's just all about Him. Because 
I can't, ex I can't explain everything and I don't know the answer to everything. But what I do know is the Christ that's inside of me is bigger than that. Amen. The Christ that's on the inside of you is bigger than that. It's bigger than all the things that are around you. It's bigger than everything that's going on in your life. And you don't need an excuse anymore. We don't need an excuse anymore. We need to understand what Jesus Christ has done in us and what Jesus Christ has done for us and understand that it's bigger than that. Whatever it is, it's bigger than that. It doesn't matter what it is, it's bigger than that. I don't, you can say whatever you want to, it's bigger than that. Whatever it is, it's bigger than that. This is where, this, I'm, I'm tired. I'm so, I'm, last, the last time I spoke, Shannon answered my question. What, am, what is my biggest fear? You, somebody's going to think I'm crazy. Somebody's going to think I'm stupid. Somebody's going to think that there's something wrong with me, that she's a little cracked in the head, okay? Well, you know what? I'd rather you think I'm a little cracked in the head than not live in the place that Christ would have me live. I'd rather, I'd rather you think that there's something wrong with me and see me in a place where I am more than blessed, that I am more than able, that I am more than a conqueror, that there are things that don't affect her the way they affect me in a good way. In a good way. And we've got to come to a point where we see and we understand truly what it means that there's a work that's been finished. That he has nothing left to do. He's not going to do anything else. He doesn't have to do anything else. Nothing else does he have to do. Why? Because he already did it all. Everything that he needed to do was provided in one work. In one work. Everything that you need to live this life that you now live was provided in one work. Everything. Everything. And we separate it and we segment it out and we make it little compartments. And okay, he took care of this, but not that we say he's not a respecter of persons, but yet we make him a respecter of persons. Yes. That's good, Andy. We make him that because of our excuses. Yes. But he's not. He doesn't, you know, we pick. And say, Daddy says he loves him most. Mm. You know what? He doesn't love anyone any more than anybody else. He didn't pick and choose. I, listen, I, I have a good, I have, a, I have an awesome idea of what a good father is. I've had a good daddy my whole life. And I know that he loves me more than anything. There's no doubt in my mind how much my daddy loves me. And I have a good earthly representation of a father. But you know what? Yes. My heavenly father's even better than that. Yes. Even better than that. Yes. We, need to, we need to take the limitations off. You know why? Because when we limit him, then we limit us. We limit him in us. We've limited ourselves because we've limited him. We've put him in a box and said, this is all he can do. This is it. There's no more that he can do. Well, you know what? He doesn't have to do anything else, but he did everything when he did it. <laughs> he did it all. I'm going to, I want to go to Romans chapter 3. In verse 21, it says, But in our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophets, prophets witness all those years has happened. And God setting things right that we read about has become Jesus setting things right for us. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. And there's no difference between us and them in this. And since we've compiled this long and sorry record of sinners, both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious life that God wills for us. It didn't say that we are utterly incapable of going to heaven. It 
It says that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives that God wills for us. It's not just about going to heaven. It's not just about someday later. It's about living a glorious life that he wills for me to live. A glorious life. Not just the life. Not just barely making it by. Not just barely making it through. I'm going to make it to the other side. I'm going to live a glorious life that he wills for me to live. God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with him. A pure gift. He got us out of the mess we were in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. He restored me to where he always wanted me to be. Where did God always want me to be? With him? In him? Right there beside him, having a relationship with him, hearing him communicate with me, me communicating with him, having a glorious life, living a life that's full of him, where I understand who he is and who he's created me to be. And I'm not worried about what's going on and what's going to happen. Why? Because I understand that God's already got this, that he's bigger than that, that he's right there leading and guiding. He's there every step of the way. He got us out of the mess we were in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. Go to chapter 5 and verse 12. It says, you know the story of how Adam landed us in a dilemma? We're in first sin, then death, and no one exempt from either sin or death. All right? There was first sin, then there was death, and no one is exempt. No one is exempt. We get that. We understand that. We condemn everybody to death. We have no problems with that, do we? <laughs> In religion, we have no problems with saying, you're all dead. You're all sinners. Adam did it. You got it. You didn't have any choice. It goes on to say, the sin disrupted relations with God and everything and everyone but the extent of this disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. So death, this huge abyss separating us from God, dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses. And even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did by disobeying a specific command of God still had to experience this termination of life. This separation from God. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one who will get us out of it. So it said, even those, everybody, nobody's exempt, even if you didn't do anything. We have a problem with that? No, why have a problem with that? We're totally okay with that. We get that, right? Okay. Yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parallel to the death-dealing sin. If one man's sin, one man's sin put a crowd of people at the dead end abyss of separation from God, just think what God's gift poured through one man, Jesus Christ, will do. There's no comparison between the death-dealing sin and this generous gift-giving life. Gift -giving life. Life-giving gift, I can't read. There's no comparison. They're not the same. They're not parallel. They're not equal. And we're okay with not making them equal, but we've got it lopsided. We got it backwards. It doesn't say that Adam's sin was greater than God's gift. It's the opposite. God's gift is greater than Adam's sin. God's gift was greater than Adam's sin, than what Adam did wrong. It was bigger than that. The verdict on one sin was the death sentence. The verdict on the many sins that followed was a wonderful life sentence. 
So guess what? Even on your mark missing, there's a wonderful life sentence that you get. There's a wonderful life sentence on that one thing, that one time when Adam missed the mark, created all this havoc that we have. But the verdict from Jesus Christ says no. No more. No more death. No more separation from me. No more of that. It's all gone. If death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing, can you imagine the breathtaking recovery life makes, sovereign life, and those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift, this grand setting everything right that one man Jesus Christ provides? You know what? It's not the same. It's not equal. It's much bigger than that. And it provided for every single person. But you know what? If I understand it, and I take a hold of it, and I grasp it, and I say it's mine, it belongs to me, he did it for me, it's part of who I am, it's my inheritance, guess what? And the death already happened so that I have it now. I don't have to wait on it. I have it right now, and if I can take a hold of that and believe who I am in him and who he created me to be, and the life that he's given me, this glorious life he's given me to live, then guess what? I'm going to live that life. I'm going to live a life that doesn't have excuses, that's not full of why nots and I don't understand. And it's full of life, and it's full of grace, and it's full of mercy. And you live differently than people around you. Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got us all in this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. He didn't just get us out of trouble, he got us into life. Life! Not just out of death. I'm not just merely making it by, squeaking on the edge. I'm going to get there. I'm not going to fall off. He got us into life. A glorious life that I couldn't live on my own. That I couldn't make happen if I tried. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. And one man said yes to God and put many people in the right. All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. But sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness that we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. And all sin can do is threaten us with death. And that's the end of it. Grace, because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into life. A life that goes on and on and on, world without end. All that, all that they could do, all that that could do was threaten me and make me fear. But if I see what God did for me, I can live a life. I can live. I can have a life that's full of grace. That's full of Him, that's full of mercy, that's full of, guess what? I'm bigger than that. You're bigger than that. You're more than that. You're more than able. More than a conqueror. More than all of those things that stand in front of you. You are bigger than that. Go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, the fretful dilemma is resolved. 
Those who enter into Christ being there for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, with ma has magnificently cleared the air, freeing us from a fateful, from a <laughs> from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the jugular when he sent his son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son, Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set us right once and for all. He entered my mess. He entered my mess. What is my mess? My mess is not just sin. My mess is everything. He entered the struggling human condition. He entered this life that we now live. And he set it right once and for all. He set me right. We need to see that it's more than just more than just saving my eternity. More than just saving my eternity. Leah says, Mama, why did God have to send Jesus? Why, why did he have to do that? Because, I mean, he just, he could do it anyway. You know, he, he could save me anyway. Provided for me anyway. He loved me anyway. He made an ultimate sacrifice for me to see and understand. Didn't have to do with him. It had to do with me. Had to do with me. He wanted me to understand how great his love for me was. He wanted me to see how much he loved me and how much he was willing to sacrifice and give so he could have a relationship with me so that I could understand who I am in him and who he created me to be. He wanted me to see. He wanted you to understand. He wanted you to see the gravity, the greatness of his love for you. He could have just spoke it could have just said we have problems seeing and understanding when he did such a such a sacrificial such a great thing we still have problems he personally took on the human condition entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all the law code weakened us as it always as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now that the law code asked, now what the law code asked for we couldn't deliver is accomplished as we, instead of doubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. Those who think that they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle and never get around to exercising it in real life. And those who trust God's actions in them find that God's spirit in them, living and breathing God, obsession with self is, there is, in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us into the open, into a spacious, free life, Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. And anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God and ends up thinking more of self than him. And that person that ignores God and what he is doing, God isn't pleased with being ignored. But God himself has taken up residence in your life. And you can hardly be thinking of yourself more than him. And anyone... Of course, who has not welcomed the invisible and clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what you're talking about. But for you who welcome him in, who welcome him in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. Your life is on his terms. 
Your life is on His terms. It's not about what's going on around you. I can't answer everything. I don't know it all. But what I do know is the life He desires for me to live is a glorious life that's on His terms, not on the terms that this world gives me. There are terms that come to you. There are things that come upon you that come from this outside world. But you know what? I don't have to accept those terms. I don't have to accept those terms. Why? Because they're not His terms. They're not His terms. They're not the glorious life that He desired for me to live. And my life should be experienced on His terms. Not mine, not what you think my life should be, not what anybody else thinks my life should be. I promise you that Dean and I live a life that nobody expected us to live, either one of us. You know why? Because it's not about me and it's not about him. I understand every single day that I'm in a place that God put me. I'm in a place that he put me. Life on his terms, not my own. And it stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bring you alive to himself. And when God lives and breathes in you as he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With the Spirit living in you, your body will live as Christ's. Is he, is he present in you? Is He alive in you? Do you believe that? Why do you limit yourself? Why do you limit Him? Why do you limit what He did for you? Why do we lessen what Christ did? Why, why would I rather live a life of excuses than a life that's full of Him? Why would I rather live a life that's limited than a life that is without limitations? Your life should be a life that has no limitations, that has nothing in front of you. There, are, <laughs> there is nothing that should stop you. There is nothing that should stop me from living the life that Christ has for me. What stops me is right here. What stops me is in between my ears. What stops me is me thinking that I'm not enough, that I shouldn't be here, that I'm not good enough. You know what? I am good enough to be the person that Christ desires for me to be. And that if, if that... I don't care what it is. I limited myself. You know why I limited myself? Because I based what I did on what I did myself. I based what I did in this life on what I, what I went to school for. They're only going to pay me so much. I'm only going to get this much. This is all I'm going to get. You know why? Because this is what they pay people who have the degree that I have. I'm never going to go beyond that. You know what? God showed me, you know what? You can have what you want. I've given you everything you need to be the person that you desire to be. You can have what you want to have. You can be who you want to be. You can be in the place you want to be. Why? Not because of me. Because you know what? I didn't do it. <laughs> I went as far as Angie could go. I went as far as I could go on my own. And I did... Listen, God blessed me there. He blessed me there. And y'all know how I feel about that. That was my job. And guess what? If I went back in today and said, I want my job back, you know what they do? They give it back to me. <laughs> no questions asked. You work. Here you go. Have it. Don't limit yourself on what you can do. Don't limit him. Don't stop because of what's here. Don't stop because of what's here. Allow what's here, what's on the inside of you, to show you who you are, to show you who be, you've been created to be, to show you who Christ is. Grow. 
He's bigger than that. He's bigger than that. Thank you.